Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming and thanks to the organizers for having me. Uh, today, I'll talk about obstructions and constructions for staircases and here's the book surfaces. Uh, this talk is going to include joint work with Lisa McDuff, Anarita Pires, and Morgan Weiler. Uh, so the main result of this talk is we're going to discuss a complete classification to which Hirzebrook surfaces have a property called an infinite staircase. An infinite staircase is going to be about symplectic embeddings of ellipsoids into Hirzebrook surfaces. And having this property is going to mean that your Hirzebrook surfaces, um, to describe these embeddings, you're going to need infinitely many obstructions to, to tell you when an embedding can exist or when it cannot exist. So this is about symplectic embedding. So a symplectic embedding is a smooth embedding such that the two form on the target pulls back to the two form on the domain. We'll use this little S notation here to uh, uh, the existence of a symplectic embedding. And whenever we have a symplectic embedding, then because the two form induces a volume form, we know that the volume of X1 must be less than or equal to the volume of X2. So we always have the volume obstruction uh, when we have symplectic embeddings. So what will we be embedding? So the domain of our embeddings are going to be uh, ellipsoids, four-dimensional uh, symplectic ellipsoids. So uh, for the purposes of this talk, because later we're going to draw these uh, two-dimensional pictures, we can think of an ellipsoid parameterized by Z. This is going to give us the eccentricity of the ellipsoid. And E1Z will be the preimage of this right triangle sitting at the origin under uh, the moment map from C2 to R2, uh, this, this map here. So the pi means that we're thinking of Z as an area rather than as a radius. But so the domain will be a, a four dimensional ellipsoid. And we'll be embedding these ellipsoids into here to book surfaces or one fold blow ups of CP2. So these pictures here are the moment map of our, or the moment polytope of our one-fold blow-up of CP2. We're going to start with a triangle of size one. This is the moment polytope for CP2. And then to do the one-fold blow-up, we're going to remove a ball of size B that corresponds to this triangle here. And then you collapse the boundary via the hop vibration, and you're left with a one-fold blow-up of CP2, which we'll notate as HB here. So B is going to give the size of the um, exceptional divisor once you do the symplectic blow up. And for notation purposes, we'll often refer to lambda HB. And lambda HB will just correspond to scaling the symplectic form by size lambda. And in the polytope picture, it just corresponds to scaling the polytope by size lambda. So the main question we're curious about is for what lambda does the ellipsoid symplectically embed into lambda HB? Um, and so to quantify uh, this question, we're going to define the embedding function. So the embedding function, we're going to have an embedding function for each B. B is going to be in between 0 and 1. It's the size of the blow up. And the function is going to be the infimum of lambda, such that the ellipsoid symplectically embeds into lambda HB. And so here is a plot of the function. Um, the, the red curve is the volume obstruction. So that's our lower bound. So if a point is on the red curve, this one here, it means that the volume of the ellipsoid is equal to the volume of lambda HB. So that's our lower bound. The horizontal axis is the eccentricity of the ellipsoid. And the vertical axis is the scaling of our um, here at book surface where we fix the proportions of our uh, moment polytope. And so the function is this blue, uh, this blue function here. And we want to, to understand what this function looks like for various B. So people have studied this function in various cases. And work of Christopher Gardner, Home Mandini, and Pires tells us that the function is going to look like one of two cases. So in either case, for large enough Z, the function is going to be given by the volume obstruction. So that means that the blue and the red curve will meet and will be in the flexible case. So you can see for large z, where we're just looking like a, a square root function. And then for, for small uh, z, the function is going to be piecewise linear. So here you see we have these this piecewise linear part. And then we have two possible options. So the first option is this option on the right here, where we have finitely many non-smooth points of our piecewise linear function. 
So on the right, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven non-smooth points. And then the other option is what we have here on the left, where we have infinitely many non-smooth points, these non-smooth corners. And those infinitely many points are going to accumulate at some finite value. So here at this black line here, we have infinitely many of these non-smooth points accumulating at this line from the left. And that's what we call an infinite staircase. So the question we wanted to answer is for which b in 0, 1 does this embedding function have an infinite staircase? So some work has been done on this question previously. Uh, McDuff and Schlenk showed that b equals 0 has an infinite staircase. This was the first infinite staircase ever found. The target there was CP2 because you do no blow up. Uh, Christopher Gardner, Home, Mandini, and Pires showed b equals one third has an infinite staircase. And they conjectured this is the only rational value other than zero with an infinite staircase. And then this group of people here, they found infinitely many irrational B values with infinite staircases. Um, and what we wanted to do is we wanted to fully classify these Bs, which ones have infinite staircases and which don't. So in work with um, Dusa McDuff, Morgan Weiler, and Anarita Pires, in, in various sets of those people, we have finished this classification, um, but today, for the sake of time, I'm just going to tell you about a very specific part of, of the classification of, of um, which of these B values have infinite staircases. And this is uh, this result here with uh, Dusa and Morgan. So um, block is going to refer to a certain kind of B values that does not have infinite staircases. And so what we proved is that block is an open dense set in zero one. And if we restrict to the interval of um, block intersect this interval here, this is homeomorphic to the complement of the middle third Cantor set. And we have infinite staircases at the endpoints of these blocked intervals. So here's a picture to kind of explain the theorem. So here we're looking at the case where n equals one. So we're looking at the interval of b values in between one half and two thirds. And these uh, colorful intervals represent intervals with no infinite staircases. So we start off with these blue intervals where we have no infinite staircases. And in between them, we get this green interval, another interval of b values with no infinite staircases. And to the left and the right, we get the pink intervals. And to the left and the right of the pink intervals, we get the yellow intervals. And this process continues indefinitely. So you can see this looks something like the complement of a Cantor set. And then what we're left with is a Cantor set. And uh, there are infinite staircases at, for all the B values in the Cantor set. Um, but what we're going to focus on today is the B values that are actually at the endpoints of um, the endpoints of the intervals where those B values have uh, infinite staircases. So for the rest of the talk, I want to give you part of the proof that uh, there are infinite staircases at the endpoints of these blocked intervals. And the part of the proof we're going to focus on uh, uh, is, is this result here. So this result says that for the B values at the left endpoint of, of these blocked intervals, so these intervals we just looked at, if you look at the left endpoint, then we can, for those particular B values, we can determine based on work of Christopher Gardner, Home, Mandini, and Pires, what the uh, accumulation point should be for those staircases. So where we expect these infinitely many points to accumulate this black line, that's what I call Z of B. And what we want to show is for these B values at Z of B, uh, the function equals the volume obstruction. So the blue and the red line meet at this very specific point, and uh, we have a, a full filling there. And so um, this uh, result is, is part of the proof that, that we get infinite staircases at these B values. Um, so how does this work? Well, the, the proof of this works on connecting um, the obstructions and the uh, the construction. So first, um, the obstructions. So we have this picture of these intervals. And, uh, and remember, these are intervals with no B values, or where the B values have no infinite staircases. So each interval is described by a homology class in a k-fold blowup of CP2. 
This homology class represents a symplectic sphere of self-intersection negative one. And work of McDuff, Polterovich, and Lee Lee implies that all non-volume obstructions to these particular embedding can be described by these homology classes to arrive in a in We constructed a mutation process on these homology classes to uh, when we have the homology class for like this green interval here, we can um, use these recursive formulas to get the homology class for the interval on the left, which we're going to call X of E, and for the interval on the right, which we're going to call Y of E. And these mutations of these homology classes are going to relate to um, the staircase steps that appear in the function. So taking um, iterates uh, of these um, mutations are going to, to tell us the, the relevant obstructions for particular intervals. So, so th this is the construction side, and now we're going to relate it to the, um, or this is the obstructive side, and now we're gonna relate it to the constructive side. So the constructive side is done using almost toric vibrations. So Symington and Leung classified closed almost toric manifolds in terms of the base diagrams with decorations for various singularities. So here we have three different uh, almost toric vibrations for symplectomorphic CP2. And uh, the pictures are, are decorated to represent the various singularities in, uh, in the vibrations. And uh, we're going to use these base diagram pictures to, to help us construct embedding. So, so what are these pictures? Well, here are two different vibrations for symplectomorphic CP2. On the left, we have the normal uh, moment polytope for CP2. So near the origin uh, at this boundary here in this picture, this looks like Z0, Z1 equals zero. So we have two symplectic disks intersecting transversely at a point representing by the origin here. We have uh, the fiber over points in the interior of the triangle are Lagrangian tori. Fibers over an interior of an edge is a circle and the fibers over the vertices are points. And then we uh, also have this different vibration of CP2. Here instead uh, at the boundary, this looks like uh, Z0, Z1 equals C for some real number C. So instead of having uh, the two disks intersecting transversely above uh, right here, we have a, a symplectic annulus. So we have smoothed the singularity at this point here. And now this, the fiber over the origin is actually a circle rather than, rather than a point. And that singularity has moved to where this star is. And the fiber over this star is actually a pinch torus. So now um, we have a pinch torus rather than a, uh, um, a smooth torus. Um, so, so why are these vibrations relevant for symplectic embeddings? Well, in, in work uh, inspired by Casals and Viana and Christopher Gardner, Ho Mandini and Pires, they use these um, almost toric pictures to uh, construct uh, symplectic embeddings. And how this works is when you have one of these almost toric pictures, even if you have these, um, these pinch tori in the interior of your, um, of your picture, if you can fit a, a triangle that, that corresponds to one of our ellipsoids inside of the picture, then you get a embedding of a ellipsoid into your, um, into your Hirzebruck surface. And when we have an embedding, this corresponds to upper bounds of our embedding function. So we can use these pictures to uh, construct um, symplectic embeddings. And one of the nice things about these almost toric pictures is we can perform these mutations on them to get, uh, to get new pictures for the symplectomorphic manifold. So here we start with some vibration of our Hirzebruck surface. And we have this ray here. And this ray is pointing in, let's say, the, the V direction. And you can think of this ray as a branch cut. And instead, let's say you want to make the same picture, but you uh, want to take branch cut in the negative V direction. So you want this to be the branch cut instead. And so to do that, 
you perform some SL2Z transformation on, on your uh, on your quadrilateral and the resulting picture looks uh, something like this. And so the upshot of this is um, uh, we have our, our two, we have the diagram we started with and the resulting diagram after the mutation. And you can see that we can fit a triangle of bigger area inside of our um, inside of our resulting quadrilateral. And this corresponds to this implies that this is going to be a different embedding because um, the area is proportioned to the volume of our four dimensional things. And so we'll get a new embedding from uh, doing these uh, mutations. So uh, what are we going to do? Well, we have our Hirtzebrook surface, and we're going to start uh, with the moment polytope, insert these three nodal rays here. And now we can um, mutate from each of these rays, the X corner, the V corner, or the Y corner. And here, we're going to just look at, at first, mutations by X or Y. And we can make this graph here of, of all the possible mutations. So you can think of a vertex in this graph as one of these uh, vibration pictures, the base diagram for the vibration. Or you can think of it as an ellipsoid embedding, the ellipsoid that corresponds to that vibration. And then the edges of the graph are um, mutate by the ray at the corner of X that will go to the left or here mutate by the ray at the corner of the Y, that's this one, we'll go to the right. And at each vertex, we can mutate by X or we can mutate by Y. And this process continues uh, indefinitely. And you can see here that I have drawn underneath this picture, um, I've made each vertex into an interval. And the structure of our, our tree of mutations here looks similar to the structure of, of the intervals that were in the theorem. So if you remember, here we have an interval of B values with no infinite staircases. And to the left and to the right of that interval, we get these red intervals where we have no infinite staircases. And to the left and the right of the red intervals, we get the yellow intervals and so on and so forth. So you can see that the structure of this, this tree corresponds to the structure of our uh, are intervals described by um, these homology classes. So um, uh, remember what we're trying to do is we're trying to construct an embedding at the left endpoint of our intervals. And we care about B values that lie in, in, in this interval from N over N plus one to N plus one over N plus two. So what mutations do we do? Well, first, um, depending on what N is, we're going to perform n plus two mutations by v. And then once we're, we've done those mutations, now we look at the correspondence between the x, y graph and our interval graph. So let's say we want to uh, make the embedding for the left endpoint of this green interval here. So what we're going to do is we're going to perform the mutations that correspond to this interval in the graph. So that's this green vertex. So we're going to do a y, a y, and an x. And then once we do uh, the initial mutations to get to the corresponding vertex in the graph, then we're going to perform consecutive mutations by y. And now what this is going to do is we're going to have a ray at this corner, and it's going to intersect this side length here. And so this side length is going to be getting shorter and shorter. And in, in the limit, it will uh, converge to a triangle. And this triangle corresponds to a, a full filling of a ellipsoid into um, our Hirzebruck surface, because there's no area left. We're fully filling a, a triangle there. And so the proof that all of these uh, mutations do what I'm, I'm claiming they do relies on uh, understanding how um, the classes, these homology classes, determine the numerics of the different vibrations. So in understanding uh, the correspondence between the, the intervals and the graph, we can see how the numerics of the homology classes tell us the direction that the rays are pointing and they tell us the length of the side lengths. And so um, this, this correspondence allows us to, to, um, to, um, to compute what these uh, various mutations do. So uh, the last thing I'll, I'll say is that um, uh, 
for this particular proof, um, we only uh, construct a very specific embedding for each B. And this embedding is this optimal embedding at the accumulation point. So it's only this one particular point on, on the graph for these specific B values. But uh, preliminary evidence suggests that for many of our B values, if we alter the sequence of mutations a bit, we'll actually be able to compute all embeddings on the embedding function before the accumulation point. So for, for small z, we can use these ATFs to get um, all of the embeddings before the accumulation point. And uh, we, we already know that the, um, that the exceptional classes will, will give us all of the obstructions. And so this correspondence between the two tells us that uh, it's possible that these uh, almost toric vibrations will give us all of these embeddings. But I mean, this is only for before the accumulation point. I think it's still a bit of a mystery what uh, some of the embeddings are coming from right, right after the um, accumulation point. And uh, I will stop now. Thank you very much, uh, Nikki. Any questions? So in the meantime, can you explain again, um, what is the relation between the, so you said that uh, you have like a correspondence between homology classes of this uh, K blow up and embeddings that are not volume filling. Can you, can you go back and explain this again? Yeah. Um... Well, so um, what's happening is that each of um, each of these, uh, well, so I guess right now the correspondence is really only for one particular volume filling embedding, but but the um, the idea is that we have these um, intervals, and these intervals are each described by some homology class, and uh, we know what the coefficients of that homology class are. So we have these numerics about that homology class. And then each of these um, each of these vertices are are one of correspond to one of these base diagrams. And to describe one of these base diagrams, you need to know what is the direction of the the rays and what is the length of the side lengths. And from uh, and you can determine that information from from the homology classes. So, the the structure or the numerics of the homology classes are are telling you what the the numerics of the um, of the vibration is for the the corresponding interval to the corresponding vertex. If that makes sense. So from that, you can read the lengths of the interval as well, or? Um, you can't, uh, like the, the lengths of these intervals. Well, we don't actually um, know the lengths of those intervals, okay. but you can, um, uh, I guess, so why this was used is you can like determine the, um, uh, like it's useful in determining the sequence of embeddings that uh, or the sequence of mutations that you want to get like these various uh, full fillings at the um, uh, accumulation point. So we have this mutation on the homology classes, which is a mutation by Y, and this relates to the, um, the staircase steps that are going to appear in an in increasing staircase. And in, in this, um, in the tree, the mutations by consecutive Ys are also going to be the things that that limit to these triangles, which are these um, these full fillings. So, uh, so the like the structure of the two things are aligned, and that uh, uh, allows you to to find the sequences that lead to these special embeddings. Okay. And what happens after the accumulation point? Um, well, so these are are for various um, increasing staircases so the so the um steps are accumulating to the left and after the accumulation point um uh it's generally more comp for these increasing staircases it's generally more complicated because uh these different kinds of obstructions that aren't as nice are um 
describing the, the embedding function. And so uh, we currently can't construct those embeddings via these almost torque vibrations. And I, I don't know if we'll uh, be able to. I mean, there uh, you have lines that don't go through the origin. So you don't have these nice scaling properties that would like be required for the ATFs to, to give all the embeddings, I think. Um, so that's a, a little more mysterious. Okay, any more questions? May I ask you, so if instead of ellipsoids, you you embed, let's say, polygists or some cubical shapes like uh, Jean Gout taught us last time, so other cases where one can prove infinite staircase? I think that uh, right now, like the, well, right now, the only examples are with ellipsoids embedding into things. And um, uh, I think that, um, well, I'm not sure. I mean, I, I, I think that uh, like some people have looked at some polydisc embeddings into things. And it seems like maybe in like the four dimensional case and that uh, maybe you won't have these infinite staircase structures there. But, um, but I, I don't know if that's, well, I think that is not known, and I don't actually know why um, uh, they should, like, if they should only appear in embedding ellipsoids, or or why that is. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I think uh, um, it seems slightly special to the ellipsoids, but but that could could be wrong. Thank you. Hey, if there are no more questions, let's thank Nikki again.